So building upon what uh, I started a few weeks ago, I want to turn to the book of Revelation. And uh, <clears throat> in the first series, you remember, um, some weeks ago I presented prophecy series number one. We focused on who is the Antichrist. And I distinguished between Antichrist's plural because John did in 1 John 2.18 and the Antichrist mentioned by the definite article, and he will rise to power in Daniel's 70th week, and uh, that'll be the seven years of tribulation. So we, we looked at that. Then we looked also at the tribulation itself on that following Sunday, uh, part one, we distinguished Israel from the church and God's economy, showing that the tribulation is primarily God's dealing with Israel. We also examined the signs which have always existed when we have tribulations, plural. Persecutions can be tribulations, troubles can be tribulations, that sort of thing. And then we examined the specific times whenever the definite article is used with the tribulation, referring to the specific seven-year period. That was part one. And then in part two, in that message, we observed that Israel knew about the second advent, but it did not know about anything called the rapture of the church. So what we did is we looked at passages of scriptures that uh, defined rapture and defined second advent. We showed the contrast there and pointed out that there is a strong contrast between the description of the rapture and the description of the second advent. And then the next Wednesday night, I spoke on the false prophet. Once again, we looked at the first beast in Revelation 13, 1 through 10 as the Antichrist, the second beast as the false prophet. And we examined the fact that there are terms uh, referring to false prophets, plural, and then there is a definite article, the false prophet, singular. We examined how he, like the Antichrist, will be empowered by Satan, and will control all religions in a massive amalgamation of religious systems that will be forced to worship the first beast. So in the message tonight, I want to focus on the 144,000 Jewish people that will be sealed by God to provide some form of ministry in the kingdom that Christ is going to establish, and they will be active during the tribulation period. So let's answer this question, who are the 144,000? Well, I don't know if you have ever been approached by Jehovah's Witnesses, but years ago when we first moved here, uh, we'd had a lot of them in, in Kentucky. We moved here, they kept coming and knocking on our door, and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses cult, they claimed that their membership would put you in the 144,000. Then they ran into a problem. The cult grew to like 500,000, and uh, I was wondering who's going to decide which of the 144,000 will actually be in that 500,000. So I guess they saw the same problem, and so they quit referring to themselves as the 144,000. Well, they never could have been the 144,000, as our study will show you tonight. So. Let's go to the book of Revelation and start in chapter 7. And I want to read to you verses 1 through 4, Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And uh, this is uh, uh, after the opening of one of the seals, uh, the seven seal book. Uh, and beginning in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, <clears throat> to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Uh, I want to notice the identifying phrase, 
of all the tribes of the children of Israel. But that's put in there for a reason. And the reason is simple. They want you to know that it is of the tribes of the children of Israel, right? <laughs> so they're not just Israelites. That would be interesting in itself. But if you look at the context very carefully, they have actually, by this time, been able to accurately trace their genealogy to a specific tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, matter of fact, if you look at verses 5 through 8, we're not going to read them, but those verses actually list each of the tribes. One is left out, but they list each of the tribes, and they show that 12,000 came out of each of the tribes. So, first of all, we know they're Israelites. That's clear. They're sealed, each of them, and each 12,000 comes out of each of one of the tribes of Israel. But there's a second thing that prohibits uh, Jehovah's Witnesses from being of the 144,000. And uh, number two, these are male sexual virgins. Male sexual virgins. Notice if you go over to Revelation 14, jump ahead a little bit there, 14th chapter, and we'll begin reading in verse 4. Notice what it says. <clears throat> speaking now of the 144,000 verses 1 through 3 clarify that he says in verse 4 these are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth these were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb and in their mouth was found no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. So, uh, John Walbert points out, the marriage state and the single state are equally as pure in the Bible. So, why in the world mention the fact that these are virgins? And the content does not explain why the 144,000 are male virgins. Uh, but I used to have fun with Jehovah's Witnesses on this one too. I remember one time I was out visiting for my church in Kentucky, and I noticed two Jehovah's Witnesses walking down the street on the same side that I'd been uh, visiting. So I went around behind, there was a, a roadway behind the houses, and I'd just come out of this one house, church members there, and I knocked on the back door, and the lady said, oh, you left the front door to come to the back? And I said, no, 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 so you got two Jehovah's Witnesses coming down here, and I said, I want to sit in your living room, and I want you to invite them in. And she said, do you want me to invite them in? I said, yeah. So she invited them in. And uh, they started off on their spiel about the 144,000. And they talked about, you know, how I could be a part of the millennial kingdom and how I could get all the blessings if I were just a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, so uh, it was a, in this case, it was a husband and wife team. Okay. And so uh, I, asked, uh, I asked them, I said, uh, I know you're male and female, and I think Jehovah's Witnesses will not send you out unless you are married. Are you married? And they said, yes, we are married. And uh, I asked, was the marriage consummated? And they stared at each other and looked at me and said, what? I said, did you ever have sex as a married couple? And they said, well, yes, of course. Then I said, well, you're not Israelites, and you're not both male, and neither one of you is a virgin, so you can't be one of the 144,000. You talk about a dumbfounded look on somebody's face <laughs> whenever I hit them with that one, okay. So the 144,000 we know are Israelites. Chapter 7, 1 through 8 makes that clear. And then we know that they are male virgins. Revelation 14, 4 and 5 indicates that. So what about the third thing? We learn about them that they are specially sealed. Now, conservative scholars generally agree that the seal protects them throughout the severest times of this seven years of tribulation. But nobody really knows what the seal is. So let's look at a couple of things here. Number one, what is the seal? Well, the Bible doesn't say anywhere in the scriptures the seal of God on the 144,000 is. So we don't really know what the seal is. But Revelation 
Uh, 14.1 says his father's name is written in their foreheads. Um, so it's possible that the full name, Yahweh or Jehovah, is written in their forehead, stamped in the forehead. Or it's possible that just the first letter of the name is used. We don't know for sure. I don't know anybody that knows. But Revelation chapter 7 describes the other angel coming forward in verse 2. And he has the seal of the living God, whatever that seal is. And in verse 3 of the 7th chapter, it says that the seal holds back hurt on the earth till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Then the 144,000 are listed, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So it appears that the name of God somehow will be displayed prominently on their foreheads. And I don't know why, and I don't know exactly what it's going to be like. So we look at what is the seal? Look a second, why even have the seal? Well, I think there are at least three reasons. Number one, one reason is always identification. Uh, <clears throat> many times in the Old Testament, there was a, a, a seal or an imprint placed on a person, or he would sometimes have a signet ring placed in the ear that would identify his owner. So it's identification. So attaching one's name to something or attaching one's name to someone proved ownership. And the great thing about that is if God is the owner, then ownership came with responsibility to oversee and protect. So these 144,000 would be overseen by the Lord during the severest time of the seven years, and they would be protected. So one reason is identification. Another reason for the seal is access. Access. Those who were sealed came to and could see the Father face to face. John Walver, in his book, All the Prophecies of the Bible, page 622, comments on that. Here's what he says. The intimacy of the servants of God with God is indicated in that these saints will be able to see the face of God and his name will be in their foreheads. End of quotation. So the first reason to have a seal is identification. The second is to provide access that people without the seal could not have. And thirdly is preservation. In Revelation 14, 1, John is shown the Lamb at the end of the tribulation standing on Mount Zion and he is accompanied by the entire 144,000 sealed members. Walford reminds us that they had a protective seal from God and that they, and I'm quoting now, were kept safely through the tribulation without losing their lives and are still in their natural bodies at the end of the tribulation, end of quotation. So in those preserved natural bodies, they will enter the millennial kingdom as servants of their Messiah. So our focus in this message is on who are the 144,000? Well, J. Dwight Pentecost explains, number one, that they're Jews. He says, God is dealing with Israel on a national basis in the tribulation period, end of quotation. That from things to come, page 214. Then he goes on to say on the same page, he says, during the 70th week, which is seven years, during the 70th week, the church must be absent from the tribulation because out of the saved remnant in Israel, God seals 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, according to Revelation 7, 14, end of the quotation. So they are Jews. Secondly, they're virgins and male. John Walford comments on page 571 of all the prophecies of the Bible. He says, and I'm quoting, under ordinary circumstances, the marital state is not regarded as less pure than the single state, but in the terrible period of the great tribulation, a normal married life would be impossible. And in order to serve the Lord without any distraction, the, rem the remnant remains unmarried, end of quotation. So they are Jews. They are male virgins, and thirdly, they have a special seal. The seal is the seal of the living God, and having it provides for them identification as a child of God, access to the very presence of God, 
and preservation from adversity by the power of God. So let's look at number four. <clears throat> they are called redeemed. So let's go back now to the 14th chapter of Revelation. And what we'll do is we'll look at verses one through five. I've already read a portion of it. Starting in verse one, he said, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 140 and 4,000 having the father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. <clears throat> and commenting on the redemptive status of these men, John Walvert points out, I'm quoting now, no explanation is given here concerning their peculiar situation. But in Revelation 14, at the end of the Great Tribulation, the 144,000 are seen again. They are pictured as redeemed, as pure, as purchased by God, and blameless. Revelation 14, 1 through 5, end of the quotation. That comes from every prophecy in the Bible, page 543. So Walbert is pointing out to us that the context does not call them evangelists that go around preaching gospel sermons, but he does comment on their ministry during the seven years of tribulation. Here's what he says about their ministry. Quoting now once again from page 543, their character and their preservation is in itself a sermon a sermon that God is able to keep those he desires to keep even in this time of great tribulation. This passage makes clear that some Jews will be saved in the end time and that some will be preserved through the end at the time of the second coming, end of quotation. So I think the safe thing is to do this. We don't want to make more of the 144,000 than the text itself does. We don't want to say they're this and they're that and so forth. Uh, we, do, we say probably the safe thing to do is to just look at what we've looked at here in the text and draw at least four conclusions that we can actually quote verses for to prove who they are. So the scriptural context clarifies at least these points. Number one, they are Israelites. 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Number two, they are men who are sexually pure. And then number three, they are specially sealed with the seal of the living God, which provides them with identification, access, and preservation. And then number four, they are called redeemed, indicating that they have actually accepted Christ as Savior and they have made it through this entire tribulation period, and they're standing with him on Mount Zion at the end of the tribulation period when he comes back, and that they're going to be entering into the earthly kingdom with him. So their very presence during and at the end of the tribulation, even though they may not be called evangelists and preachers, their very presence and, and safekeeping is a testimony to the preserving power of God. And then the same preserving power, catch this now, the same preserving power that we're looking at there is the very same preserving power that is promised to each one of us as born-again believers in Jesus Christ. So we don't have to worry about uh, all of the attacks against us, the threats against us, and things like that. Uh, the question is, are you ready to have happen to you at any given moment what God's will is for you? That's the real question. I remember flying on an L-1011 
42,000 feet, 585 miles per hour, and uh, made friends with an elderly couple sitting across from me. We were in one of those seats where I sat on one side, they sat on the other. They were going to visit relatives in uh, another country. Uh, I think they were going to Helsinki, Finland. <clears throat> and we were going to stop in Vienna, Austria, and uh, they were going to be getting off and getting another plane. And when I told her what I was doing, she said, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, no. She said, you're smuggling Bibles into the Soviet Union. I said, yes. She said, aren't you afraid? And I said, no. I said, according to the Bible, my times are in God's hands. I said, could I be arrested? Could I be put in prison? Of course I could. But also I serve a God who can preserve me from anything that is a threat to me until he wants me to experience that threat. And I said, that's the way I want to live my life. I don't want to live my life in fear. I don't want to live my life in anxiety. I just want to live my life and commit it to him. And I said, it's like Paul said in Philippians chapter one, he said, if I die, let that glorify God. If I live, let that glorify God. And so I think when we look at these 144,000, they have a present message to give to us, even though we won't see them until the tribulation period, according to Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14. So are you trusting God? Do you know him as your personal savior? Are you willing to trust him to protect you from anything that threatens your life until he says it's time for the threat to be realized? Let's stand together for prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your blessings in our lives. We thank you for our people coming together tonight. We thank you, Lord, that <clears throat> we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior. And Lord, we thank you that we're not afraid to face anything that will be brought against us. We're trusting you to hold our times in your hands. And now, Lord, as we open the altar and give an invitation to those who may need to trust Christ or those who may need to come for any other reason, we pray you'd work in our hearts now. In this moment, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.